What comes into your mind when you imagine what heaven is like? I mean, what do you picture? Do you imagine the pearly gates? Or or is it people sitting on clouds all day long, just hanging out? And, And like this picture on the screen right now, I mean, do we have wings? I mean, what does our body look like? Are we just spiritual beings flying around? I mean, at the end of all things, at the end of all of humanity, whenever that will be, what will eternity in heaven be like? I mean, have you ever given that much thought? Well, that's what we're going to be unpacking today in our final week of the Big Picture series. If you have not been journeying with us over the past month and a half or so, we've been working through a six act series uh, that covers the entire story of God's activity in history. As we survey, we take a step back and survey the big picture of the Bible. And instead of simply telling you where we have journeyed, I would also like to show you where we have journeyed. And I'm going to, it's going to take some creative involvement on your behalf. So if you're following along in your outline, uh, draw these pictures with us, please, in the space that we've given you there. Now, we kicked off this series by unpacking the first two chapters of the Bible. In these first two chapters, we read how God created a wonderful, ordered universe full of beauty and potential. Human beings are uniquely created in God's image to live in a loving relationship with Him. Humans were existing in perfect harmony with God and with one another. It was literally paradise on earth. And then we move to Act 2 into the third chapter of the first book of the Bible. This is where we went from a virus-free bubble to ground zero of the deadliest, most lethal virus the world has ever seen. It was like an atomic bomb went off. And just like an atomic bomb radiates everything it touches, sin damages everything it touches. What takes place in this chapter is responsible for every tragedy, every death, every trauma, every trial, every war, every assault that ever has happened, is happening, or ever will happen. They could all be traced back to this event in this chapter in this book. But God promises that he will provide a way to be saved from this sin. So God initiates a rescue plan. He created the nation of Israel to deliver on his promise to rescue the world. But just like us, the nation of Israel faltered and stumbled along the way until finally the person of Jesus, who is the Son of God, took on human flesh and lived a perfect life on earth and died once and for all for our sins. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of our wrongdoings and be in right relationship with God. Jesus not only died for our sins, but also resurrected from the grave, proving that he was who he said he was. And then in Act 5, the message of the risen Jesus was taken all over the known world and the church as we know it was born. And that is where we are right now in human history. Which leads us to Act 6 of the Big Picture series, which we've entitled, Redemption is Complete. Now, I'm not quite ready to tell you what to draw in that box just yet, so you're just going to have to wait a few moments. But Act 6 is part of the story that has not happened yet. This is part of the story that will happen at some point in the future. You see, God initiated redemption in week 3 in Act 3, But it's not yet complete. It's been initiated, it's in progress, but it's not yet complete. So, what does complete redemption look like? I mean, if you're a Christ follower, what are you to look forward to? What is promised for the future of every Christ follower? Well, it's actually in the last two chapters of the Bible, in a book called Revelation, where we see God's ultimate intention for creation come to pass. It's in the last two chapters of the Bible when we see God's final purpose unveiled. The Apostle John, one of the closest followers of Jesus, he's being punished for his faith by the Roman authorities, and as a result, he's exiled onto the island of Patmos, which is just off the west coast of modern-day Turkey. While exiled there, he's allowed a vision 
of a new heaven and a new earth entirely cleansed of sin and cleansed of evil. The Apostle John is given a vision of the world which we currently live in, which sin currently is dominating, give way to a renewed creation where God fully rules. I, I want to read this vision to you. John explains, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Here we see a new Jerusalem, which represents God's people who are living in God's presence, coming down from heaven to earth. Now, if you're following along in your outline in your Bible, underline the words coming down. Here we have this picture of Christ followers in heaven coming down to earth to be with God. We have this picture of heaven coming down to earth. And keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that in a few moments. But this vision continues. John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will, will be with them and be their God. Now, what we just read has always been the goal of God's relationship with humanity. The goal has always been for us to be close to God, for God to dwell with us, for God to be first in our lives, for God to rule and reign in our lives. I mean, that's how God originally created humanity, to walk closely with, to dwell with, to be in relationship with. And in this new heaven, in this new earth, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, John explains. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And so here we hear of a world where God removes sin and all its effects on the world. And God comes to dwell in this renewed earth with his creation. So the question needs to be asked. What does a completed redemption look like? What does that look like? Well, when you begin to unpack this vision that the Apostle John had, you realize that it actually looks a lot like Act 1, where God created and dwelt with his people. You realize that it looks a lot like God's original relationship with Adam and Eve before the fall, before they sinned where God had a direct, loving relationship with his creation. And here we do a full circle back to how God originally created things. You see, in Act 1, we saw a glimpse of the relationship that God wanted with humanity. God walked with them, interacted with them. God and humanity lived in perfect harmony. And that is what it will be like when the redemption plan is fully complete. God's relationship with human beings will be healed. And then we, we, we're back to a pre-fall, pre-sin, Eden-like relationship with our Creator. And not only has our relationship with God been healed, but the relationship between human beings has also been healed. It's a world where love now reigns, where there are no more tears, no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. It's a world where the damage of sin is reversed, where God's rule is now fully here and God has restored all things. I mean, what a beautiful picture this vision paints in our minds. I mean, what a wonderful place that will be when this redemption is complete. But as beautiful as it may seem, I don't know about you, but I still have a bunch of very practical questions about all this. I mean, what exactly does this look like? What is heaven? Where is heaven? What are we like? What do we do? Well, let me take a few moments to answer some of these questions and perhaps debunk the image of heaven that some may have. 
Unlike popular opinion or common depictions, when you study what scripture says and read what scholars say, you realize that when God's redemption is complete, as your outline says, we don't go to heaven, heaven comes down to us. We don't go to heaven, heaven comes down to us. Oftentimes, people can think that heaven is up, up in the air somewhere, way up in the clouds. We can think that we will spend eternity in heaven, which is far, far away from here. But that is actually not true. According to scripture, heaven is not an escape from earth. Heaven comes down to earth. And through this vision, we learn that we could expect a restoration of God's original creation. We could expect a renewed earth. I mean, remember what John saw in his vision. He said, I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, those two words, coming down, have changed everything for me. See, heaven is not made up of individual souls escaping earth and going up to heaven, up in the cloud somewhere. In the Apostle John's vision, we see heaven coming down and transforming earth. Heaven will be this physical earth renewed. Heaven is this material world healed of the atomic bomb of sin that was unleashed in Act 2. Now, perhaps as you listen, you're skeptical of this. You're not sure of this theology because perhaps it goes against what you were taught growing up or what you picture in your mind. Well, listen to these interesting words penned by the Apostle Paul in a letter that he wrote to the church in ancient Rome. Teaching on the hope that we have to look forward to, he speaks about creation. He says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are, for that day when redemption is complete. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, meaning creation was impacted by the sin that we all feel. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. You see, we read here that creation itself is longing and is in eager expectation for this time of restoration as it too has been affected by sin. You see, when God set out to deal with sin, his plan was not to destroy creation and just get rid of it. Remember, when God created the world, and you can read this in the first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, he created the universe, he created the world, and he said, he looked at it and he said, it is good. Creation is good. It's not creation itself that needs destroying. Creation and the physical material world in and of itself is not evil. The answer is not to destroy the earth and wipe it away. No. The answer is to destroy sin and wipe away sin and wipe away all its effects as well. And not only are we longing for that day, but according to the Bible, all of creation is longing for that day to come as well. You see, humanity and all of creation are longing to be part of the world that we never And this will not happen in a heaven up in the sky where we sit on clouds and play harps all day. It is this physical earth renewed. Remember, we don't go to heaven. Heaven comes down to earth. As your outline says, in heaven, we don't have a spirit body. We have a resurrected physical body. In heaven, we don't have a spirit body. We have a resurrected physical body. Another way that the Bible explains this is that we will have a glorified body. You might be thinking, well, how do we know this? Well, the Apostle Paul, when speaking about our future redemption, he says this. He says, but Christ, speaking of Jesus, has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
He says, Jesus has been raised from the dead and he is the first fruits of those who have died. Meaning his glorified resurrected body is what we are to look forward to. So what does the glorified resurrected body of Jesus look like? I mean, what are we to look forward to? When Jesus resurrected from the grave, he appeared to his disciples many times. And I want to show you one of the first interactions the resurrected Jesus had with his disciples. Notice what he said about his body. Jesus appeared to his disciples and scripture says they were startled and frightened. So would I. <laughs> I'd be the same way. But they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He goes on. And while they still did not believe it because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. You see, the Apostle Paul explains that we can learn about a lot about our future resurrected bodies by reading about Jesus' resurrected body. According to scripture, we have good reason to believe that Jesus had a physical resurrected body that ate food, and so will we. Can I get an amen? <laughs> that means in heaven, you and I, you're all invited over to my house for a big old barbecue with steak and burgers and all the fixings. We will have a resurrected physical body that can eat. In heaven, we're not disembodied spirits it's floating around on the cloud somewhere. No, we have a resurrected physical body that is on this renewed physical earth. The big difference between this earth now and this earth at that future time is sin. When God's redemption is complete, sin and all of its consequences will be gone. That means when redemption is complete, we cannot sin as all outward and inward temptations will be gone. Simply put, there will be no more sin. Now, that's some pretty interesting information to think about. But you might be thinking to yourself, well, why does all of this matter? I mean, what does this future reality, what difference does this future reality make to my present life? I mean, why should I care about this? Here's why. The answer to that question will actually serve as our big idea for today. This matters. The future matters because your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. Your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. What do I mean? Two men were brought to a field and they're told that they will be paid to dig holes all day long for 10 hours a day for one year straight. The first guy is promised $20,000 for his work for the year. And the second guy is promised $20 million for his work for the year. And at the end of the first month, the first guy who was promised $20,000 takes his shovel, throws it down, and he quits. He says, this job, it's the worst. It's too hard. My body hurts. The sun is scorching on me. I quit. I'm just not worth it. But the second guy, doing the exact same job for the exact same amount of hours, with the same sun scorching him, with the same back pain aching him, is whistling and singing songs while he works. Why? Well, it's because of what he believes about his future. He's promised $20 million after that year, and that controls what he does in the present. You see, these two men, they're experiencing the same circumstances in two totally different ways because of what they each believe about the future. When the Apostle John wrote this section of the Bible, he was writing to a people who were suffering terrible, terrible things. 
At the end of the first century, the emperor Domitian was the first emperor to organize a large-scale persecution of the early church. Christians had their homes taken away and destroyed. Christians were thrown into the arena to be killed for sport as the crowds cheered. Christians were impaled by stakes and burnt at the stake. Christians were crucified along the streets of Rome so that as people entered the city, they can see these individuals dying slowly. The recipients of this ancient letter were facing a type of persecution that our Western church cannot even fathom. And what does John write to these people who are going through these types of circumstances? He writes this. He says, listen, there will be a day where heaven comes down to earth, where all of this will be restored. There will be a day with no more suffering or pain or sorrow or tears. There will be a day where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. John saw and heard about the traumatic and horrific situation that these Christ followers were in. And to those people, he wrote about the hope that they could have in Jesus. And the hope is this. Your pain and your suffering, although very real and incredibly difficult, is temporary. And this very real and incredibly difficult pain, with the perspective of eternity in mind, we could understand that it is very temporary. In the midst of their persecution, the Apostle John gave the church true Christian hope. Why? Because your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. I want to show you something. I have here a rope, a very long long rope that goes on and on and on and on and on. In fact, I want you to picture this rope going on for eternity. And this blue tape represents your life. This blue tape represents a life of 100 years, more years than most of us will experience on this earth. And the rest of this rope, it goes on and on and on, it represents the rest of eternity. The rest of the rope represents our lives in a renewed earth with, the, with our resurrected bodies living with no pain, no fear, no sorrow or tears in God's presence forever. Now, in your hundred years, I don't know what you're going through. I, I don't know what tragedy you experienced at 15 years old. I don't know what mental health struggles you experience at 32. I don't know what trauma you faced at 55. I don't know what difficulties you have at 78. But here's what I do know. When you have eternity in mind, when you take a step back and you understand the big picture of what the Bible teaches about our present lives and about our future hope, these trials and these difficult days, perhaps this difficult life that you have right now, are but a blip on the radar of eternity. In view of eternity, with the big picture in mind, all these things in our lives can be seen as light and momentary. Remember, your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. Two people could experience the same circumstances in their lives in, to in two totally different ways because of what each believe about the future. The Apostle Paul was no stranger to this persecution, to a difficult life. In fact, he says this regarding our current pain and suffering. He says, therefore, through all of this, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, though our bodies are breaking down, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on our lives and our present circumstances, but what is unseen. 
because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I mean, this was a man who was beaten and shipwrecked and tortured for his faith. And he says, those things in my life are light and momentary troubles in light of eternity. In view of the big picture, your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. According to the Bible, you can have hope for the future. And all six acts of the big picture series have been pointing to this one truth. You could have hope in Jesus. You could have hope in Jesus. Why can we have this hope? Well, because we know that when God's redemption is complete, at, at the end of human history, everything that sin has once wrecked, God will restore. And understanding that truth Understanding that big picture changes everything about how you experience life right. Why don't you bow your heads with me for a moment as I pray and close. As I pray, I want to ask and answer one more simple question. Perhaps you're sitting here and watching this and thinking to yourself, how do I experience this restoration? How, how do I experience this that you're talking about. Well, it's by believing in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's by accepting his forgiveness into your life, by asking him to forgive your sins and beginning a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God. If that's you, I simply want to pray for you and with you. And I would just ask if you want to begin that relationship with God, or perhaps you have had that relationship before, but as you find yourself now, you're kind of off the road, you're off the rails. I would encourage you to rededicate your life today. Simply agree with me as I pray on your behalf. Our God and Father, we thank you for the hope that we can have in you. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die and that through him we could have forgiveness of our sins. God, we want to accept this truth into our life and we want this to transform every part of our lives. I want to begin my walk and my relationship with you today. Transform me from the inside out. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer with me, if you made that decision to follow Christ, the best decision that I can give you, the best advice I can give you, is to text the number on the screen right now. We have a pastor on the other end. We'd love to help you in your walk with God. Thanks for joining us today.